I was thinking recently about uh, just how nice it is to be old. Yeah, you know, old. Like what I am. <laughs> I'm old. I have come a long ways in my life and kind of enjoy where I'm at today. You know, I I look around and I see what God has done. I take stock of my life and I say, well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I've enjoyed the life that I've lived to the fullness of the expression of grace that God has given me. And I've completely been satisfied in all that the Lord has done in my life. And would there have been things that would have changed? You know, a lot of people like to say, oh, but if I only had not done that or I had done that. I've never done that. I've always thought, God forbid that I would lose out on the lesson that I learned from the things that I experienced. Because in many ways, had I not gone through that experience, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I thank God for who I am today. <laughs> Maybe you do too. Maybe you've been through it and you like your battle scars. You know, you like those things that have like sliced and diced you, you know, and brought you to a place of grace. Because if you haven't, well, you might still be out there trying to fix everybody and trying to change them and rearrange them into some image you have of what they should be. I kind of like the idea that God knows better than I do what a person should be and that he sets up standards and goals, you know, that he brings us to that we all have a uniformity of experience, but except a man choose himself which way he shall go, there's no way that he's going to freely decide to give up his free will in order to follow God unless he makes a decision. Because we don't have Christian slavery. We don't have the impression that we have to force or somehow compress people in these last days into becoming Christian or becoming Christ-like after the way we describe what a Christ likeness should be. Because there's a variety of people out there. I mean, there are people that are like gung-ho into military. There are people that are gung-ho into protection services. There are people that are gung-ho into security. And there are people like me. <laughs> and I'm like into everything. No, I'm kidding. But no, it's like, I'm not fearful of you know anything. I'm not worried about you know somebody breaks into my house and threatens my family, you know, because Personally, I know the scriptures say that God protects my household. So if God's protecting it, then if somebody breaks in, then God wants me to do something with that person. And I don't think it means shoot them <laughs> or, or beat them up. I might be able to witness to them. You know? and that's kind of where I live differently maybe than some. And there's a lot of people like me, but there's also that variety of experience that God allows for the Davids you know, that are out there, you know, doing battle in the name of the Lord and suffering the consequences of partially taking lies, but partially, you know, dealing with violent nature of mankind, you know. Whenever I look at the world and I see the world's solutions, I'm always brought back to the Sermon on the Mount because I don't see the world as having any solution at all. As a matter of fact, I see the world solutions, whether it be in philosophy or religion or mankind's humanism or any kind of ism that is man-made and man-directed as being a failure of mankind. I don't see men getting better at becoming civilized. I see them declining as far as becoming godly. That in the beginning, I believe godliness was God walking with us. And that was godliness. And now I don't think God can even stand the sight of us sometimes, you know, that, hey, you, could you take a bath, get cleaned up a little bit? You know, I mean, man, thou stinketh. Because <laughs> we got a lot of stinking thinking. You know, we think we've got it all together, you know, or we've got this righteousness that we think fits. But when you get to heaven, I think we discover, oops, I think we got it backwards. We elevated the wrong things and put down, unfortunately, the things that God looks at most important. You know, like peace, love, joy, meekness. I mean, how many men, manly men, yes, that I am, look at meekness as a quality to be desired? 
I don't think so. I think they're looking at the alpha male type. I think the alpha male type is for dogs, not human beings. Pardon me, but Jesus, in my opinion, isn't a wimp, but he isn't the alpha male that most people make him out to be. I see Jesus as the Son of God, and that with his ability to just think it and we're gone, I don't think he needed to assert himself as being some kind of manly man, yes, and pride and ego, because that's more of a Western civilized idea. You see, in the Western culture, there's this idea that man has to elevate himself. And Jesus said the opposite to his disciples. He said, don't be as the Gentiles are, who love to exercise lordship over one another, but he that would be great among you, let him be the servant of all. Let him be your servant. Let him come under you, underpine, gird up, strengthen, enforce, lift up. I don't know, but I like the old idea about that. Remember what used to be said about gentle giants, you know? That there was always that big, tough guy, that big, giant guy that turned out to be just a gentle soul inside? Nowadays, it's like, you know, the big, gentle giant turned into, you know, the massive football linebacker. You know, and he ain't no gentle person. <laughs> but you see, in age, when you've lived long enough, you see how the world and its ways have gone in full circle and they keep doing circles and circles like hamsters in a cage running their little games and running it over and over and over again. Kind of like the political arena, you know, you hear the same story over and over again you start going, didn't I hear this four years ago? Didn't I hear this eight years ago? Didn't I hear this twelve years ago? And sixteen and twenty and twenty-four and twenty-eight. Hi! <laughs> you begin to see that the world really has no answer for us. Because this is not our home. This is not the place that God intended us to be. He never said that because you're born in corruption and you're born into a corrupted world that I want to leave you there and let you be corrupted even more so than you already are with when you were born. But rather, I came that you should learn incorruption, that this corruption would put on incorruptible and that this body of flesh that I live in would perish with the corrupted earth that it is part of. But the spirit, the meekness, the gentleness, the kindness, the joy, the love would go forth almost like flighted wings and take us to a place that we've never been. To a reality we don't know about. To a concept that is antithesis or antithesis of what the world says. Because the world says, assert yourself. Jesus says, submit yourself. The world says, stand up. God says, serve me. The world says, be obvious. Jesus says, be hidden. Jesus, can I talk to you a minute? Man, you just don't get it. You know, we we, we got to build up people's self-esteem, you know. we got to get them kind of like hyped up and worked up, you know we got to get the power of positive thinking going here, you know, and give them some good enforcement words, you know, so that they can be power people, you know, power this, power that, power here, power there. Oh, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places we wrestle against. Really? Really? That kind of power? You mean when we get power, we're not supposed to have power? I don't know, but I do know that when we cast down our crowns before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, I don't think that that crown was given to us to keep. I think it was given to us to yield to he who can make the right judgment. For you see, there is a judge. He always judges. He's judged for us. He's already accounted all of us guilty before the beginning of creation even started. But he also provided a way of escape that we would be able to bear that condemnation, that conviction, that right judgment that a righteous judge can make upon us because we are all sinners and we're God and we're definitely born equal in one way and one way only. We all sinners. I don't care if it's a baby, newborn, and you think it's innocent child. It's born in sin, conceived in sin. So from the minute that life was incepted inside that egg and the ovum became a living soul, it was born dying because it was separated from God. 
and except to become born again in the Spirit, it's going to hell, no matter what it is or who it is. I know that there's always this funny, you know, funny idea of this, you know, like all babies go to heaven. So you know that last recent, you know, woman that went to Texas, you know, and they won't let anybody interview her. She killed her babies because she was told that that all babies go to heaven. So she used as her defense, and the, even the defense lawyer was a little shocked at the time that. All babies go to heaven because, after all, that's what pastors have been telling people lately. You know, well, don't worry about your little unborn child. After all, David said that I'll go to be with my child. You know, even though David was alive before the cross emptied out hell and the pit or the, the Abraham's bosom, the grave. Even though David said that before then, people have used one scripture to try to make a comforting soulless to comfort ye, comfort ye the women who have feared for all these children that have died and perished. For we want to invent a new doctrine and dogma just like the Catholics used to do in order to make people feel good about not knowing that God is love and that God would already know where the child would wind up irregardless of whether or not you were allowed to raise it completely but that child would have raised up to become a Hitler. So God didn't allow it to grow full born. God didn't allow it to become a monster. But God does, in his sovereignty, decide the fate of all living human beings, irregardless of when they were born and when they die. So knowing that God could do that, do we say there's a new way of salvation? Because after all, that woman killed her children. She said, my life was so miserable, I drowned them in the bathtub. And she did. She drowned them in the bathtub, and she offered up that in tears and in remorse and no remorse whatsoever that realization before the judge that she said I knew that they deserved a better life and I knew that as soon as they died they'd be home with Jesus so she killed them now someone say well that makes sense after all God can save anybody by no other name shall man be saved except by the name of Jesus Rachel weeping for her children, for they are no more. Irregardless of the way that we want to comfort one another, like the world wants to do, and the world invades Christianity all the time and tries to say, hey, we got to tell these people something. You can't just say that babies, as pure and innocent as they are, die and go to hell of all places. No way. That's too mean. God isn't mean. God is not unrighteous. God is not unfair. So we'll make all babies go to heaven. Let's go there. Let's go with all babies go to heaven. So that way we can start slaughtering the children. We're, it's called the murder of the innocents or the slaughter of the innocents. When Jesus himself was born and they killed every child in the city that he lived in. The tragedy is that theologians at one time knew this. And they didn't teach this. It's never been, oh yes, we have this teaching, this popular concept that we call the age of accountability. Oh no, they're not accountable. No, just because God says they were born in sin, conceived in sin, and will die in sin, that doesn't square with scripture. I mean, oh wait, that is a scripture? Jesus, that doesn't seem right. You see, when people don't understand God in His love and His mercy and His kindness, they try to invent ways to make God do something that He doesn't do. He is perfect in His love, perfect in His forgiveness, perfect in His mercy, perfect in His righteousness. Because He's perfect, we, if we are in sin, do not enter into that perfection. That's just the bottom line. It's not a pleasant teaching. It's not a positive teaching that somebody can take and run with and say, oh, well, now we can rearrange it and make it into our own image so that we can comfort these people. I'm sorry. If you don't know that God is love and that he spared, in reality, creation from suffering the devastation of a corruptible being, I don't know how you want to apply this except to know that God is love and that you shall not take into heaven some corrupted being and then say, well, you know what? They all, they're all hanging out there with Satan. You know, they're all hanging around there because Satan was a corrupted being, so you know, he wound up in heaven at times and then still presents himself, you know, to accuse the brethren until he's finally 
you know, removed permanently. I'm glad I'm old. Because, you see, I learned that when I was young. And I know that people hated me when I would share that. Because they would say, well, you're not being very loving or very comforting. And I'd say, I don't like to say to anyone straight up that just lost a child that because I would comfort them with the solace with which God has given us because the one that has no children has so much more children than the one that they think that they had because after all God said that the father of the fatherless and the childless would have even more children but there is a truth that the reality of the person who thinks that God is not love always makes up these ideas and doctrines and dogmas that are false they bring out this whole idea and concept that God is unrighteous if he was going to condemn his own creation his creation that's been converted into something that isn't the way he intended it to be so he puts it back on the pot you know and starts over in your life he takes that life that's laid down and has died in order to make you into his image that you might bear good fruit because no offense whether you call the baby an unborn baby or a baby that's born or whatever whether you call it life a womb a perfect little innocent child or whether you call it bad fruit because the fruit of your womb whether it be raised unto righteousness as a vessel of honor would be praise the Lord God I'm so glad that you've allowed me to raise this child and this child's been trained up in the way of the Lord and it's followed it all the days of life Back said for a little while, but came back to the Lord, you know, as it says in the scripture, train up a child in the way that you go, and when they are old, they will not depart. God, I'm thankful for that child that you've given me. God, I bless them, and I encourage them. Oh, God, what happened to that child? That child that didn't have a father or mother, that somehow has gone off on a tangent in a murdering spree, and has never admitted to knowing you. God, how could you have let such a child grow up to be? a mass murderer like me you see we slay with the tongue and God holds us according to grace with mercy but those that don't know Jesus he holds mercy to us by not allowing them to live so sometimes in your own way of dealing with hell and heaven you need to deal with the reality of how far God goes in order to save a soul and to prevent anyone from going to a place we all know called hell and that is by way of his die because there is nothing whether an unborn child a born child whether a slaughter of the innocents whether a baby that a mother kills in the name of God in order to send to heaven which is false whether it be any of these things there is nothing compared to humanity killing God. Deicide. When we took our hands and laid upon the Son of Man, the Son of God, our sins, literally, in the day that we committed sin and were born in sin, and Jesus died for that sin, that we would be forgiven if we would ask to be forgiven, if we would call upon the name of the Lord, if we would seek Him, if we would follow Him, if we would worship Him, if we would know Him. The person that knows Jesus has no problem in asking God about anybody, whether it be innocent children they think that are innocent. All they need to do is philosophically, if they wanted to, instead of going the world's ways, study the scriptures and they can find the facts. They know that. Because the fact is, there is no age of accountability. It's not 12, it's not 13, it's not 6, it's not 2, it's not whatever age you need it to be in order to fit your personal theology. Because the scriptures are blunt and clear. There's a heaven and a hell. And the reality isn't a pleasant place to be. Because if you're heading for heaven, praise the Lord, it's the greatest experience life can ever manifest to you because this is temporary. But eternity is coming to us. And we who know the Lord and have been saved by His grace are moving into eternity forever and ever. But those that don't will be eternally condemned.
they will be eternally sent to the lake of fire where it will all be purged as it were from the universe of creation it will all be contained in a place that could be separated from God himself if it were even possible do we understand this? no but that's what makes it so unique and so holy that's what makes it so important that's what makes the reality of who God is being that God is love so important to teach, to share, and to be realistic about. Because we've played with sin, and we've indulged in our fantasies and our realities without taking into concept the very stark nature of how God will judge you and I. How dare we play with theology if we don't revere a holy God? I'm glad I'm old. <laughs> because when I was young and dumb, I would follow anything that people might have said until I went to the scriptures and found out what was true. When Jesus talks to me, he shares with me the love. But he doesn't deny me the reality of what he wants to change in me or what he wants to change in you. Simplicity is the keynote of my kingdom. Choose simple things always. Love and reverence the humble and the simple. Have only simple things here. Your standard must never be the world's standards. Sometimes it's heavy to have to be able to share the reality of the balance of what God is in his just scales as he presents himself to us in these latter days. There are people that are going to go to hell. There are people that will not be raptured. There are people that will not follow God with all their heart. They'll follow him fleshy. And like we used to teach in the Jesus movement, get ready or get left behind because that's the reality. That's why it's not like people want to argue about this partial rapture or full rapture or pre-trib or post-trib or mid-trib or whatever trip that you're on, trip that you're on. Because you see, God is sovereign. If God wants you to be here after the rapture, you're going to be here, period. It doesn't matter what you did, what you didn't do, what your righteousness was, or whatever your thinking was. Because when we trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not into our own understanding and all our ways acknowledging Him, He does direct our path. But that means He is sovereign to direct our path. He can choose to do whatever He chooses to do. If you're a Jeremiah, guess where you're going? If you're a Jew, maybe, who knows? You may leave all Jews behind. I don't know, I'm just saying. But the point is, <coughs> God is sovereign. And in the letters to the seven churches, there is no doubt about it. Six didn't go and one did. That means somebody's left behind. God help us if it be you. Because if you're not ready, why would you be left behind? Unless you've already taken and abused grace to the place where God said, there is a line that I know not where. Chuck Smith used to sing this song. And I... I, I, I I tremble at it because he made it sound so serious. It was like, what if you cross over that line of grace into condemnation because you've gone beyond where God would say? And he said that there is a line I know that you know men will pass. That no, I've given you over to your own lust. I've given you over to your own wrongness. God help us. I praise the Lord for men of God that are coming out with the seriousness of how big our Father is. Not just that he's some daddy and sugar daddy, but that he's also God. And he loves us. But he also will judge the world. And he's going to pour out his wrath upon the world. And there will be people here that are called Christian that he will pour upon the wrath. The church itself, quote unquote, body of Christ, will be gone. But there are those churches in the letters to seven churches that will remain. And some may have your name on it or mine. Pray to be counted worthy to be spared all these things because the world right now is invading the Christian world. It is telling you what it wants you to hear. There are so many people that tell me all the time about, well, God said that you know all ways lead to heaven. All paths go to God. Allah is God. That's not a Christian statement. That's a humanist statement. And it's invaded the world to universalism. So there's a lot of things that 
unfortunately, I'm not saying to point out and pick out and say they're wrong or right, and, although all of you could point out and say that's wrong, but some of the things that people are getting into are going to lead you to a place you don't want to go. Choose the simple. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Follow after God, and you won't fall into all these other things. Stick with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and you can't get confused. It's simpler than you think. And that's why people get lost when they try to interpret and apply theological memes, hermeneutic, homiletic, and drash, and all the other realizations of interpretation that they want to take the scriptures and put it worldly wisdom into it so that they come up with some kind of solution to tell people. And you don't need to tell them anything else except God loves them. God has died for them. God has given them every opportunity for salvation. They need to do no other thing except call upon the name of the Lord and they shall be saved. Because God will lead them to that place of salvation. Call. Come, Jesus said unto me. The Spirit and the Bride say it. All they need to do is come. So let us not aggravate people by telling them, oh, well, you know, we need to talk about all the different you know, dogmas and doctrines that are wrong in the world and all the theological ideas that have come up through the centuries with humanism invading and you know, all these other philosophical ideas that Christianity has presented itself within the religious context of its own religion. Let us deal with the relationship of religion that magnifies the joy that God had for us when he saved us in the beginning and we loved him with our first love that no matter what he said we were willing to do let us go to that place and stay there for there is not much time left and you don't need to know what maybe some of us already know about ages of accountability or all these other false ideas that have been inserted to make you feel good because Christianity isn't a feel good proposition you can enjoy the peace, the love, and the joy in the midst of the trials and tribulations that you're going through that are devastating your soul and causing you to experience the full gamut of emotions that human beings have, which is crying and depression and sorrow and sickness and disease and all these things that some people say, oh, but as a Christian, you shouldn't have that. No, I got it. I did it. I've been there. And I had peace in the midst of it because Jesus was in me, because Jesus was with me because Jesus walks with me and talks with me because I go to him and I don't listen to men. So you see, the full spectrum of our emotions is always there. We are meant to have those, but we have peace in it, the fruits of the Spirit and the love and the joy and the meekness and the kindness and temperance and gentleness. And those are the things that are going into heaven when we leave the flesh behind. So your choice is simple, whether you want to be of the flesh or be of the Spirit whether you be led by God or led by man. Because that is your devotion. Which way will you choose? Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But he chose what was right over righteousness. He chose to go with what God said and told him to do each day over what man wanted him to do, which was proclaim himself king. Let us today lay down our lives and look again at Jesus. Let's examine again the Sermon on the Mount and recognize what if we were living in that day. Because today is the day that the Lord has made. And if Jesus were standing here today, his Sermon on the Mount would be exactly the same as he said it then. Because it is what he wants us to do today.